I'm Michael Goldman. Welcome to another installment of Studio Daily's podcasts from the Frontline series, where each month we talk with filmmakers from various disciplines about their work on current major feature films. And this month, our guest is production designer Barbara Ling, discussing her painstaking work returning major Los Angeles environments back to the way they looked in 1969 for Quentin Tarantino's new period piece, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The movie, in many ways, is a Tarantino love letter to Los Angeles and its unique landmarks and vibe from that era, at a time when Hollywood stars, rock and roll, and the Manson murders were dominating the scene. The movie follows a TV actor, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his best pal, his stunt double, played by Brad Pitt, as their adventures and struggles and interactions inadvertently lead them into an encounter with the infamous Manson family on the eve of their historic killing spree. Ling supervised a massive project to return streets, stores, restaurants, facades, interiors, and backgrounds to their 1969 versions, one of the most challenging projects of her career. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Barbara, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to, to find out, had you ever worked uh, with Quentin Tarantino before, or how did you get involved and lured into this uh, very impressive project? Uh, I had not worked with Quentin before, but I had met with him uh, when he was doing Hateful Eight, and it was a kind of a wonderful meeting, and um, he had a designer for that, and then it kind of stayed in his head, and uh, he co- luckily called me. Um, uh, after you know a few years later and said what about this one so it's it was a you know a fantastic experience working with him and when I read the script I just went over the moon I just had never read anything like this so it was like a great novel so, and it's you know I'm an Angelino so it couldn't have been um, a more perfect union of us together on this one. Well, th- this movie is certainly, uh, among other things, a-, a love letter to to Los Angeles in a very unique era uh, when some very unique things are going on. Uh, but if I understood right, in, in your career, um, you've done all sorts of different stories, but one of them was uh, working with Oliver Stone on The Doors in 1991, uh, which also took place uh, roughly in the same era and, and showed parts of Los Angeles back then. Was that experience something that, you know, gave you a kind of a comfort level to take on this job? Um, Were there lessons you learned then that you got to apply here? Or or is the art and the craft and the technology all totally different uh, so many years later? Well, the the craft is pretty similar. I mean, you know, Quentin very much wanted this to be a a real world. So it meant no CGI. It meant, you know, really putting back. The biggest difference between this and The Doors is... um, the doors that we still had more buildings available to us. Um, the amount of buildings that have been torn down and high rises and glass buildings put up in its place is unbelievable, actually. I mean, even as we were doing this film, they're tearing um, huge sections of the city down for really glass towers. So we couldn't have done near what we did on the doors in terms of Sunset Boulevard because they just have taken most of the older um, architecture down. So in this case, uh, Hollywood Boulevard being one of the really center points to Quentin, you know, luckily has still whole sections of the original architectural of the buildings are there. We had to rebuild facades, but it wasn't um, a series of glass towers. And, you know, it is farther down on Hollywood Boulevard, but not in our sections. And it's hard to do L.A. It's getting harder every year. Um, We're not a big preservation city. We're a city of reinvention. And unfortunately, reinvention means um, tearing down architectures. And and I want to get, get obviously, into to many of the, the, the specific locations, but, but I did want to uh, uh, follow up on something you just said uh, a, a couple minutes ago that, that Quentin really uh, did not want computer-generated set extensions, which are fairly fairly common in the industry now, as I understand it. it. Maybe you could explain why not, and given the fact that so many of these facades and locations were no longer there or had radically been altered, uh, you know, why it wouldn't have been a good solution for, for certain cases, and was there really none of it in the movie or very little of it or how did that work? almost none of it 
zero. We may have a few moments where we took uh, Dijkstra took out a building um, in the way distance that was uh, there, but nothing, uh, everything close up. Quentin is very much wanted to feel and smell and be on that street or wherever we were, and for himself and the actors, is that it had to be real. You know, we, we picked, and, you know, a few, there was skylines that, you know, you had to rub out. He was willing to let a little of the rub out happen, but nothing close up. So, you know, when to put back a marquee, you know, most marquees now are LED marquees. There's almost none left as a backlit with three-dimensional plastic letters that you change out. Um, almost all everything is done in LED um, screens for the um, in front of theaters. So to put back the original marquees and the um, neon and all that is you know um, a big feat. But it, for him, it was everything. But particularly the theaters, very much very important to him that they go back and be the real world of 1969. And on the facades of the buildings, it's the same thing. If you're if you got rid of all of your facade and you're just a piece of glass with a door that takes you into a souvenir shop, we went back and put um, the original facades back on and then redressed to what was the stores that were there, be it a TV store or be it a record store, or be it a poster shop. And it's, you know, it was a, a extensive work, particularly Hollywood Boulevard, which was done in two sections. You know, we, the city wouldn't allow us to take all the area we wanted and close it at the same time. So we did it in two blocks with two months apart so as not to impact the street any worse than we've already impacted it in traffic jams. And, and I do want to get more into the Hollywood Boulevard story and also the, the alteration of uh, Westwood Vo Village and, and some other places. Um, but but generally, given that this was uh, the desire of the filmmaker, um, you know, you, you, you sit down with him as the project gets underway, he gives you a mission statement. You know, what was your process of kind of reference and, and design? Well, we're going to have to build a lot of facades. How do we make sure they're, they're accurate? How do we build them correctly? How do we move them in, hang them up, move them out uh, and not interrupt or, or, or mitigate how much you're going to interrupt the businesses that might be there uh, today. What was sort of the battle plan that got formed? Well, the, the start of the battle plan was, of course, research and getting a visual research of what was there in 1969. We had a fabulous researcher, um, Lance Malbon, who, you know, found besides going to libraries and archives, found individual photographers at the time, um, which was incredible because getting color photographs was almost impossible. And he found an amazing amount of photographers who let us into their private archives. So we created first, you know, we built kind of a Hollywood Boulevard 1969 in research and then went through that, you know, I went through all that with Quentin surrounding, you know, our icon buildings, be it Musso and Franks or whatever we were on Hollywood Boulevard. And then we went in the, to the next phase, which was actually designing the facade, figuring out how it would attach, because with these marquees, the weight of them, it was having engineering come in. Of course, locations dealing with the building owners, being able to um, say yes and making deals with them to actually put facades on them. And then we built as much as we could off-site and then brought things in piece by piece with construction first, paint right after them, and then the final was the uh, uh, set dressing that went into the storefronts that we had just dressed. All of it done almost like military precision because we could never close the streets to the tourism. And of course, that's huge there. You had to kind of work with them, which was fun because they got to see things happening and that was exciting, I think, for the tourists. Um, but it was also, you know, a lot of tourists right in the way of the cranes going in. It was a feat to, to work with it all at the same kind of time frame. And just as fast, it had to all come down. So, But there was a, a glorious moment of seeing 1969 when it all lit up and the cars came out and the extras totally dressed. And 
it was a, a reminder of that time period that people got very excited about. Well, you talk about, um, you know, uh, sort of the logistical challenges. Um, you know, people think, uh, I think the stereotype uh, with some justification, production design, obviously it's an artistic craft, an artistic endeavor. Um, but it, it does sound to me like uh, for a project of this nature, project management, um, politics, engineer, you know, dealing with the city of Hollywood, uh, getting permits, closing down streets, altering traffic, you know, these all had to be part, part of a, a skill set for you and, and your team uh, to accomplish it. And I, I would suspect you had some uh, difficult roads to navigate, particularly in Hollywood and the Chamber of Commerce and how protective they are and uh, of businesses there and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's where Quentin really shined, you know, locations, because this, as you you can imagine, is an incredibly difficult job for the location manager and his team, uh, because there's, you know, hundreds of owners on Hollywood Boulevard. You know, there's the guy who owns the building and the guy who owns the store and the guy who has the apartment above the store and the other guy in the apartment next door. And, you know, there's a, a, it's a, a, a battery of ownership. And, to start it, to go to the Chamber of Commerce and to the um, Hollywood Council locations, you know, said, look, you know, Quentin, if you would come and address them too. And Quentin did and said, you know, this is, you know, how I became a filmmaker, was being on Hollywood Boulevard and going to movies. And, you know, uh, I want to bring it back for this brief time to for the glory of what it is. And, you know, just was so impassioned that, you know... Um, they said yes, because it was an amazing feat what we did. And I don't know if without that incredible, impassioned speech from Quentin to them, they would have really got it, you know, and they did. And he does have just an infectious love of this city, particularly the heart of the city, which he feels is Hollywood. So that actually was a, a, a great barrier to have them say yes. And then it was really the feat of Rick Schuler, the location manager and his team, who had to make all of the connections for us to get into the buildings and measure. You know, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's always a team in front of your team, so to speak. I think the, the great thing is that we had no complaints um, and this was a pretty huge impact. And yet the store owners and the building owners were um, really pleased to be part of it and to see that moment of history go back. So we're, we're lucky that uh, we did it the right way and actually made them uh, all very happy. And you, you, you mentioned your, your location manager, uh, Richard Schuler. Maybe you could uh, speak to the collaborative nature of this, uh, of this job anyway with people like, like Richard, your, your art director, uh, Richard Johnson, your set decorator, mm-hmm. Nancy Hay, uh, working with, with cinematographer Bob Richardson to make sure he could get cameras and, and lights in and out of where he needed to get them. Um, all these uh, disparate units and disciplines uh, kind of, coming together what, what was that that uh, teamwork process like well you know that uh, it starts with um rick it's actually rick schuler um the location manager and rick and i started in the very beginning and his team and his verve also in love of the city really helped push you know um we had a very good reference points of, for each other so You know, I would show him some visuals and, you know, they would go out and come back. And, you know, his patience in the enormity of this, of the squad that he had to run and working, you know, once we get a location, it's then working back with my art department, with my Richard Johnson, my supervising art director, who's kind of the the orchestra leader of all the people who are doing whatever individual sets. And that impact of breaking down with locations of we need construction to be on the boulevard this night with two cranes. They're going to put up this. They're going to do that. They have the engineer there. You know, those are very um, key and difficult points is actually your moment of actually building. And, you know, Rick's team was always there with us. And Richard Johnson is an amazing scheduler, so he worked with all the scheduling department between those two departments. And then Nancy Haig, the decorator, 
who had, um, ironically, the, almost the least amount of time, because by the time everything was structured on particularly Hollywood Boulevard, painted the signage, the neon up, she had a very short window with her army of people, which was a weekend, actually, two days to dress an enormous amount of stores. And the ingenuity of her in almost practicing it off-site of what a store is going to look like and how the how we're going to place every every poster and everything in the window you know she's a phenomenon and um and her team is and they were the the ones who were the very last they were the icing on the cake with the least amount of time because we had to actually close the store once it was being dressed and that was they gave us two days to do that and then we uh, started shooting from the Monday through the week. But that interaction of those people are actually is respect. We had such a very tight group of team leaders, so to speak, um, in art direction and in Nancy and set decorating, that I don't think we would have, we would have had complaints had we not had the team we had <laughs> because it was um, a phenomenon of, human bodies and how many things could be done in a 12 to 14 hour day each day. You know, again, Rick Schuler and his team were so great at being um, spread out along places like Hollywood Boulevard and willing to work with any little impact that happened. And there's a lot of odd, you know, you're in a heavy tourist area, you have People dressed up like Spider-Man in their own homemade Spider-Man outfit. And they want to come over and try on clothes that the art departments, that the dressers are putting in. And you go, no, no, you can't. And that locations has to come and help control that. We should have sh shot the, the background of what it was like to actually finish that street. It would have been a movie in itself. You know, just some of the facades, uh, these exteriors that we're talking about. I mean, Musso and Frank, a very famous restaurant, still there. Uh, and there was a couple others, uh, ones down the street from, from where I live, uh, Casa Vega, and there's the El Coyote. There was Peaches Records and, and Tape. There was Orange mm -hmm. Julius, a Hamburger Hamlet, um, Stan's Donuts. Um, and, and one that, um, that I recognized, uh, because when I, I don't want to say how old I was, but, uh, I couldn't take my eyes off of it when my father would drive me up and down Hollywood Boulevard is the Pussycat Theater, which was, you know, uh, basically a porno theater back when they had such things, uh, that, that was across the street from, from Musso and, and Frank's. Yeah. So, you know, when, when I think of design, you know, I, I think of designing something original. Um, what is the challenge of reproducing something that already existed uh you know do you just look at a picture and just copy it or there's a lot more involved yeah there's a lot more involved because you know the building it was on is no longer that it's a uh, a giant led screen building so there's no architecture that was left of the building and when you look at a photograph you know, a photograph doesn't really tell you architecture. What the photograph tells you is a one-dimensional look. So you have to figure out, okay, now how did those letters recess back? What was the building looking like? So then you're building the building back, building the letters back, trying to find the best photograph you can of whatever that top thing was, which was a, a little icon disc. And you're, you're recreating a piece of architecture, but without the original architectural plans. So it is actually a feat. And that was one of the hardest of all, because we were putting such a large facade back onto a building that had been stripped down. And the building owner was very nice about it, because we did have engineers making sure that nothing pulled the building off, you know. But that was actually a very difficult piece to put up there, to, to recreate and to um, feel like it was the full recreation. You know, it's, it's never easy um, recreating because you are actually the layering of what's on it and the store that was next door and the, what did the snack bar look like and what were the posters and what was the, you know, what were the posters that were on the building? 
you know, all of that becomes, um, a, you know, a piece of your layering design on top of design rather than just a um, straight copy. Because it's also the feeling of what's on the buildings around it. You know, what was the, what was playing at that time? Because Quinton's very specific at his um, dates. So, and Quinton wanted everything to be very dated. So every marquee, the movie and the times that that was playing, actually Quinton had all that reference because he's an encyclopedia himself in film. So whatever the double feature was, whatever times it was set on it, was exactly the day that we were shooting the date in, that, in the script. And same with the TV shows and the advertisements and the bus advertisements going by. Everything was actually very pinpointed to the exact time and day that we were in. And even though most people won't know that, I'm telling you it because it was impressive to, you know, that Quentin has that, that much encyclopedia knowledge. But, you know, he had all the original TV guides of that time. So we knew when the man from uncle, what time he was on and, you know, the bus ad that says man from uncle, you know, co-starring tonight with whoever the actor was at nine o'clock. It was exactly the advertisement that was in that week's TV guide. So it, it was very specific. Um, Quentin really loves real and the realism of that and having uh, it's the graphics that actually become really this the third layer of the icing on the cake on that street and the black light posters and the the different things that were of that time period of that month in that time within the same time as the movie that's what was pretty great. And then we, we, we move over to uh, Westwood, um, and, and you mentioned earlier, you know, the, the facades of the theaters. I guess one was the Bruin Theater, um, the Bruin and the Fox. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of one of them, uh, though, in the movie, we go inside, we go in, in the interior, and there's like, uh, you know, um, kind of p posters, and, and there's uh, little pop-up stands and things, um, you know, advertising different things. Uh, reminded me very much when I went to the movies in that era in like Los Angeles. What, what was the challenge there in, in Westwood and particularly in, in dressing that, that theater to be exactly the way it would have been 1969? The, the Bruin actually was the Bruin in 69 and the Fox actually was the Fox. Luckily, their, um, their icons on top are still the same. The facades, again, uh, the same thing is that they're now LED um, marquees and they let us, you know, changed that two nights before we shot, which was great. And they worked with us beautifully. They also got so excited about it. They said, you know, we have a couple of the old um, poster, inside poster stands up in storage, um, which were these kind of deco looking, you know, they rolled them out of storage for us. We had a couple of those in the lobby. We redid the exterior um, where the posters are, uh, back to their original look of how they had a little marquee proscenium around them. Inside, we actually put our own, um, you don't see it, but the height of where the screen is projected is very different now from 69. So we put our own projectors in, in the back of the theater, so that all of that was um, perfect height to what, of how it was when you sat in the theater and looked at a projection onto the um, screen. And the, you know, the fun of just putting back some of the lobby stuff, of course, you know, every lobby in those days had cigarette machines and stuff too, which was so interesting. And the exterior was actually not so easy. The, you know, the, the new streets of Los Angeles now are called zebra crosswalks, which if you look is those big fat white lines. And in that whole center area of Westwood, it almost looks like Tokyo. It's so many, and they have horizontal crosswalks and diagonal crosswalks. Believe it or not, all over LA, we had to keep taking those out. So there'd be scenics taking them out and putting just two lines across. And then we'd have to dash back the next day and paint all that back in again. We changed the, you know, the street posts. We changed the um, 
Taco Bell that was next to the Bruin into a hamburger hamlet, because that's what was always next to the Bruin, um, and put their big, that striped awning that is so well known for them with the hamburger hamlet signs. And then across the street, which I'm interested that you said Stan's Donuts. Stan's Donuts have been there since 1960. But it didn't look like that. And they had a very hard, and they still, it's still owned by the grandson of Stan. Stan is still alive. And his third generation is now running it. And we found one little tiny black and white photograph of what the original looked like and um, talked to them about the colors. And we put back Stan's back to, which at that time was, didn't have Stan's as big as it did its original name and uh, put that back to all its glory and brought in Stan. They brought him out. Uh, he's 90 something. And he just about cried. He said, Oh my God, it looks like the day I opened it. And then we refacaded um, the two streets next to him back to what they were at that time, which was hair and wigs and a couple of different, and a lot of clothing stores, Campbell's clothing. You know, Westwood was quite a, a shopping center in the 60s. It's changed dramatically now, but, um, you know, it's where everybody on the West Side went and shopped. So we put back the two sides of clothing stores that used to be there. And uh, you, you you mentioned in Westwood that, that uh, switching the Taco Bell to, to, a ham, to the well-known Hamburger Hamlet, I thought I heard a story about you racing down uh, Tel Segundo near the airport to build a Taco Bell at a place that was about to be uh, demolished or something we like did. that? We did. We did. You know, Quinton really wanted, you know, the iconic early fast food. And for him, it was um, Der Wiener Schnitzel, the original Der Wiener Schnitzel, not now only known as Wiener Schnitzel, and uh, Taco Bell. And we found um, one building that was boarded up and was about to be demolished that still had the, you know, that if they let us re-renovate it, we could get it back. And we took that, re-renovated it. Taco Bell was very nice in letting us um, recreate the signage um, and uh, the three-dimensional signs of Taco Bell and the little uh, Taco Bell man, the sculpture of him. And so we rebuilt a Taco Bell just to have that sign, to have that blink, so to speak. And we did the same thing um, in with the Dravener Schnitzel. We found one of the old buildings, which was now a uh, tankeria, but um, was about was had closed. So they were willing to let us paint, put it back, and, ha and again, we got permission to put the original Dervener schnitzel. We had that made, three-formed uh, plastic made, and had that put back on top and put back the original menus on the drive through But yeah, Quentin, it's that very much, uh, he wanted both those. And th this may be a bit of a, a, a dumb question, because in most movies, I mean, I've been writing about this stuff long enough, I, I can usually tell. In, in this one, it, it's a little more complicated for, for interiors. Was there much set work done, were, were, uh, built on stages, um, or did you really go to all these locations, the Playboy Mansion, homes on Cielo Drive, that kind of thing? How did that work out? We, we did get the Playboy Mansion. Um, you know, it's it's now owned by somebody else and it was um, under renovation. So it was stripped of everything, you know, that you think of for Playboy. But um, again, Quentin um, really wanted to, to, if he could, have to get the real mansion. So we did, with enormous amounts of negotiations and meeting and saying that we would, you know, I would put back the front which was uh, all of the greens, the lighting of that period, which was always very theatrical. You know, they used theater lights whenever they lit it up for parties. And um, we put back the interior foyer we, uh, with furniture that was uh, very close. And, the, uh, of course, the lagoon area in the back we redid and kind of got all that back to its formal glory. So we had the Playboy... We just had to put it back to Playboy because it was under renovation and pretty much stripped down of everything, even most of the uh, foliage, because they were, you know, new owner has a whole new idea for it. 
but he let us have it to, to shoot, which, you know, I thought was great. It's hard. To, we could have faked it, but it would have never been it. And again, for Quentin, he wants to feel that we're really at least within the piece of. We didn't, um, uh, we used with the restaurants, we were very lucky. Of course, Musso's, as you know, is so iconic and has changed very little. They, the waiters themselves, you know, worked with us to say, oh no, that would have been over there now. And this, and they brought out plates that would have been 1960 something plates. And, um, but pretty much the interior of Musso's um, is the interior of Musso's. It's a miracle. It's still so fantastic. Casa Vega is very close. We just had to um, go in and put the decoration back to the 60s and get rid of all the TVs. You know, it's, there's a lot of flat screens now. And they were they love Quentin. These are Quentin's haunts. I mean, Quentin loves Casa Vega. He loves El Coyote and Musos, and he goes to them all the time. So he's a regular in all three, which is the only reason we got the filming time we did, is because they love him as much as he loves them, because Musos closed for over a week, and they've never done that in their life, but they did it for, for Quentin. So and El Coyote, they let us uh, take out walls that were inside that weren't there in the 60s and put them back. We altered to get everything back, but um, the buildings, yeah. And the exterior of El Coyote, we put back uh, the exterior lighting, the glass phone booths that used to be in the driveway, the, um, and actually built a, a sign that's no longer there that used to be there that, that said El Coyote on the side of the building. A little more um, touchy is the issue that there's a couple scenes that take place uh, uh, in the home where the Manson murders took place, uh, the Tate Polanski home on Cielo Drive up in the hills in Los Angeles. Um, if I understand right, that that home was demolished. Um, for uh, for both yes. the interior and exterior, how did you replicate that home and and come up with the same feel while not being uh, you know not overdoing it? Given uh, that that has bad memories for a lot of people. Yeah, no, we didn't. Uh, we used um, we did use the the real El Cielo Street where you see the cars coming up and making the hook to go up the hill. We did get permission to use that real stretch. Um, the rest of El Cielo, it doesn't look like it did, so we did not. We found another street in the hills, and this was a very difficult location to get two homes. Because Quentin, you know, his his script and his head knew exactly how he wanted to shoot, particularly the crane shots from the pool going over and going through the trees and then seeing the Polanskis get in their car. That was from the very beginning. He said, I need two houses, but I need one that I can have a pool and I can take a crane shot. This is where, again, with Rick Schuler, you know, it was just, that was probably the hardest location to find was the architectural setup that would give Quentin his um, movement with camera. And that was a series of, two houses that um, I facaded um, and uh, gave the, the feeling of what the Tate house was. And in the ins inside, you know, same thing. And then Rick's house, we had uh, the exterior was on the street and the exterior pool and the exterior front and the interior of the house I designed and put on stage because there was so much action in that house that it had to be specifically designed to work with stunts and to work with um, the choreography that Quentin had in his brain. So that was actually Rick's house was done in, in uh, two stages, inside and outside, some practical and then some on stage. It was a, a difficult combination set, but I think it worked beautifully. And when we say Rick, uh, we're referring to the main character in, in the film, Rick, Rick Dalton, Dalton, yes, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. Exactly. Um, and, and and the the exterior with the pool uh, and, and sort of overlooking the the beautiful uh, vista of, of the valley there in, in Los Angeles. 
you know, and, and then all the action that takes place in that house. For for those who haven't seen the movie yet, we 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 won't spoil it, but but it's an important yeah. location. Um, yeah. And then uh, his co-star, his cohort in the movie, Cliff Booth, played by Brad Pitt. Uh, by contrast, uh, he lives in a trailer uh, behind mm-hmm. the drive-in theater in Van Nuys, um, right. right near where I live here. Uh, what what was the sort of the inspiration and the approach for for, for that location? First is, you know, both Quentin and I were, you know, we have to have a drive-in. And there is no, you know, all the great drive-ins were torn down. And really, there just was no, you know, hesitation in both of us, you know, just saying, it's got to be Van Nuys drive-in. Because that had such a cool mural. I I loved everything about the Van Nuys drive-in. And that's, um, so we... We recreated that. We were uh, once we started getting into a drive-in, then it became well, you know, Rick maybe Rick would live somewhere near the drive-in so that it would make sense that he's you know going past the drive-in, and that's when this behind you know in looking at drive-ins, uh, the only ones left there's a three or four of them, and they're there's no front you know beautiful. F- facade anymore and there's no more murals but this one drive-in had behind it a car wrecking factory (laughs) and there was something so appealing about that being that if we used our the back of our screen in once that was once a real drive-in it was maybe to put his uh, trailer back there and then we wanted to also bring in you know the oil derricks that once existed all through LA. You know, there used to be oil derricks everywhere. So we tried to, we wanted, that was a great place to just throw one of the oil little rigs uh, on the backside, which it was in the valley. Anyway, so it became a combination of ideas and then putting Rick's trailer there so he could drive home and be looking back and there'd be a movie, you know, in his backyard again always reflecting film, which is very much Quentin. And um, we had his real trailer on site, and then we also built his interior trailer because all the scenes with the dog, you know, would have been very um, difficult to shoot without having uh, walls we could pull. It's always difficult working with animals, and you can't, a trailer would have been um, prohibitive with, with no other feature of being able to pull walls so we did both real location with he and the dog and then we built it on stage and and one other location i I have to ask you about before we wrap up uh, of course is uh, the spawn ranch the former movie location uh, where the manson family actually lived for a time when they were uh, engaging in their nefarious activities did you go to the real ranch well, the real uh, ranch location is just a, uh, it's actually like a mountainside now. You know, they, all of that burned and then they bulldozed the whole thing down back in the early uh, 80s, late 70s. And then actually put earth, you know, built earth up e- even over it. So you can drive by and just see bushes and kind of a mountainside. And there's nothing left of what was fun. We had a lot of, again, with Lance, my researcher, we did a lot of research with uh, the layout. And then this is where, you know, I wanted to be near, and I wanted that terrain because the look of the Santa Susana Canyon area is a specific, you know, very rocky, kind of brushy area. And um, Rick uh, Schuler and his gang, the location guys, found uh, not too far, probably a mile and a half, two miles from the old Spawn Ranch in the Santa Susana Canyon area, a park that had once also been an old movie site in the 20s. And I mean, very early days. Nothing, no buildings were there. It was, um, there was some slab concrete where once buildings were, but it had that physical terrain and it had beautiful kind of had the same idea of trails in the back because of course George did do trail riding uh in his later life and that's the the Mansons actually did that for him you know they would take people out so that area once Rick uh talked to the park service and asked if 
it, it was possible for us to get it. And we got it. And that became breaking down, you know, where George's house is, where once the, the little western fronts that were part of the motion picture side of that um, were, and then also the stable area. And, and we created a spawn ramp from scratch. Uh, and, and all of the trucks, you know, we had to bring in an enormous amount because it was really kind of a graveyard of um, cars and automobiles. There was also a chop shop there. The Hell's Angels used to work out of areas of um, bikers used to work out of areas of that. So, what you know, we, first we did it is what the original Spawn Ranch Western Town would look like. That's the first sense of design. And then you go on top of that, the layers of years that had gone through and the dilapidation of what it had become. And then, of course, George's house, what it had become by then. So you see the little, in his, George's house, you see, you know, in his heyday, you know, he liked to collect great statues and stuff. But by the time the Mansons and family had been slobbily living there and stealing from him, and it was um, pretty trashed. So, you know, so a few of the neighbors started a little bit flipping out about, whoa, whoa are you guys building Spawn Ranch? You know, because there was old timers who lived in that part of the canyon who remembered Spawn Ranch. So they had to kind of calm them down that it's just temporary. Um, but we, we are out of time. But as we sum up, um, you know, from your point of view, you've been doing this a while uh, as a production designer. You know, for you, what, what was the big uh, lesson that you took from this project? How did it ex you know, impact you, make you a better production designer? Well, I think the, uh, the the biggest impact would be is how, um, you know, how coordinated in this film, which is, is a, you don't always get this, where you get the best of best, you know, um, the, you have the best location departments, you know, the, the best um, art department, you know, I got a, had an incredible team, but you also had these, you know, an amazing um graphics team in my art department. The, the car, Steve Butcher, who ran uh, the entire auto division of this, who no matter what I could come up with, because I was remembering all the trucks and things from our era of, you know, tidy dye diapers and, you know, ED do plumbing. And I would find photographs and he'd find those vehicles. And then we graphics, we put the old graphics back on so that always in the background of everything, the motion, because L.A. is about cars and it's about what that the life on the street is. And, you know, each department head uh, in this film, I think the one great thing I learned from this is that when you have that kind of quality in department heads around you, you know, uh, and, and this is a lot of Quentin's people. You know, Quentin has a family. You know, I'm a, a newcomer and a few others are too. But, you know, Bob Richardson, these are, you know, it's a family of people that have been with Quentin for years. And there's a reason for it is that this is a um, tight team and it's a, it makes a huge difference. I mean, you see this picture as, a, as an overall experience because it, it was done in a very short amount of time. A worry to me was how short of amount of time we had for prep, but we were, you know, Quentin very much wanted to, he had an end date to get this out to con. So that all of that became, uh, but it's this team of people, every department head was amazing. That was the great thing is that I worked in it with a perfect team. Well, it, it was certainly, uh, among other things, a, a master class and uh, how to do a, a period piece in a way w that makes the era, um, you know, a character, but, you know, part of the story. Exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you. And that was another Studio Daily podcast from the front lines, my conversation with production designer Barbara Ling about her adventure shooting Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch your inbox every month for more newsletters directing you to our monthly podcasts covering the art, science, and people involved in the world of feature filmmaking. I'm Michael Goldman. Have a great day.